I'm one of those people that are dealing with some issues in my life concerning friends because I long for friends and when I have a lot, I wish I have less. Listen, there's other friends that are not as friends as they might seem to be friends. And so I've been taking some time, and I think my wife is somewhat aware of this, that I've been taking some time in studying why some people have more friends than others. And most of these things concerning friends has to do with the tongue. If you're a person that is a bit shy, you will have less friends. If you're a person that have, has a tongue that can speak about any time, anything, you might seem to have more friends. And so I have, today I want to speak about the tongue. The title of the message is, however, not that. The title of the message is actually a, a, uh, a continuation of another message I had on the sower's field. And today I want to speak about the sower. I want to speak about the sower. The title of the message is simply the sower. Many times when we speak about the tongue, we're often referring to, in fact, in years past, when I spoke about the tongue, was often that I was speaking about things that offend others, words that we speak that hurt each other. And I'm, I'm happy to say that the Lord did not direct my path that way concerning this message because I don't believe we have a lot of that here in this church. I don't believe we have a lot of people hurting each other with their tongue here. Yes, there might be instances, but as a whole, that is not what I'm trying to correct. The message that I have today is not a message of correction, but is a message of direction. Because I do understand that we're all sowers and we're all fields. And it depends a lot on what we say in life is where we will be in the future. I understand the word of God that way. I understand the way of life that way. I understand Christian principles that way. And a person that seemingly is negative in most of the things he says and speaks with his mouth is often a person that will experience much negativity all through his life. I find that we cut our path through life pretty much with our mouth. And that's even according to the word of God, that our mouth is a huge instrument in guiding our footsteps. Uh, brothers, John, I believe, said this morning that we have, what, 500,000 words that we speak a day. I also believe 500,000 steps that we take. We walk as much as we talk, typically. And where this leads us and where this guides us is what I want to talk about today. This message is something that sprung up in me as I observed. I observed people. And when I say that, I'm not trying to put you under guilt that I have a handle on understanding people in any way different than any of you have. However, with much experience comes some understanding. And the understanding that I have gleaned in this is uh, in which I will be talking about. Before I go that far, I would like to just pray if we could. Father, in the name of Jesus, I speak to you as a voice. I speak to you as a voice. I speak for you as a voice. I understand today my hands have very little to do with ministry. My feet have very little to do with ministry today. And my eyes have very little to do with ministry. My ears as well. And every part of my being has very little to do with ministry except that which is making a sound at this point, And that's my tongue. And I understand that we have so much. That you have given to us responsibilities that are pretty much all dealt with with our tongue. I notice also that in your word, the spoken word, that which you have spoken, is the word that stands. And we also know that the words that we speak is that which stands. And according to your Bible, you tell us that the day will come when we will have to speak of why we said what we did. Lord, I also pray that today you might allow us to have an understanding of the direction and path that we take is often guided by our tongue. And I pray that today, you might show us some things in life that I have found in your Bible and also have observed in my own life and observed in people's lives as I have lived 55 years. Father, I pray that you might anoint this word and it might go into the hearts of everyone that hears, that it would change something that they desire. I pray this in the name of Jesus, Lord. 
Let there be anointing here today. Let it come from heaven. Let it be a spiritual thing. Let it come from the Holy Ghost, Lord, that would deal in the hearts of us, Lord, to give us direction, to give us guidance, and to give us answers of issues that we deal with from day to day. Father, allow us to see that things don't just happen. Many times it's because we create it that way with our own tongue. So, Father, today we want to sit at your table and we want to eat of it. And I pray that strong enough conviction would fall upon our lives to put a desire to change things within us. And so that you could deal with that part, which is our heart. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The sower's field. We understand that we are all a field. We understand that we are a sower. And the Bible is very clear that what a man soweth, that shall he also reap. And I believe that Christianity as a whole has a big misunderstanding concerning sowing and reaping. Thinking perhaps that what I have sown when I was a young man, sown back in the days when I lived a sinful life, that today I have to reap because of that. I do not find any principle in the Bible that will hold true to that. I do not find that God somehow holds something against you that has fully been repented of. Because repentance and forgiveness. Forgiveness is when God says, I owe you nothing anymore. If God would have this principle and hold it strong, that when we do something wrong and, and repent of it, if, if, if this is what the judgment seat of Christ is, every one of us will be condemned if God continues to hold things against us. So there is something that God will not hold things against us when we repent of them. And many times when we think about the sower, we think of a sower as being someone that has sown his seeds in the past, way back then when you were a teenager, etc. That's not how I understand the Bible. I understand the Bible as the sower that reaps. He sows often not with his hands. He sows very seldom with his feet. But most of the sowing that he does is done with his tongue. And that can simply mean, as I go through life and I say certain things, I throw out the way I visualize myself, the way I live, the way I understand myself is, as I go out during the day, I keep broadcasting like a little spreader. Some of you have one, some of those. You put seats in a bag, and there's a spreader underneath it. You can rent them at Holmes Rental, I'm sure. They would have them, and you can... Uh, you can you turn this little wheel and it spreads seed. And you walk away from that seed, sometimes you forget that you've even seeded anything until later on in life, all at once, something starts growing that you don't understand. And this is where reaping comes. And reaping comes from something that has not been repented of. Now there's reaping to the good and reaping to the bad. Reaping to life and reaping to death. And today, we just want to go through some of those things and, and talk about that. I would also like to say to you that I've worked on the sound system that it works well. It doesn't hinder me in any way, so it's, it's good over here. I, I have no problems with it. So, the sower is a carrier of seed spreading along the daily activities of life. Tragic reaping that many don't recall. Sowing turns into a sad picture of life lived recklessly without the fear of God. I'm, t I'm writing a book, and in, in one chapter out of this book, I have it as the sower. And I took some ex excerpts out of that chapter to bring forth today because my eyes have really been opened as I study this, that many times we, I have seen and experienced sitting with people that have experienced tragic things start going wrong in their lives, not understanding why. But when you search back into their lives, you find that some seed has been sown. I can give you an example. I'll give you some examples as we go down through here. One of the things that I would like to just talk about a little bit is two people, sometimes our own kindness. See, I, I, would, I would like to say that most of you have some sort of kindness in you. People with a mean streak in them even have kindness. I would say most of you have been known as very kind people. But some of you, it's easier to be kind to some than to others. Kindness. How is it done? What is kindness? It is often reflective off of what you say. 
I, I just want to exemplify two people a little bit in the beginning. They both did the same thing. They were both kind. But one was a righteous kindness, and the other one was an unrighteous kindness. And it goes back into the Old Testament. And this is Uzzah, which you know the story of how Uzzah, he was a man that steadied the ark when the ark was falling off the cart as it was being returned. It was falling, it hit a threshing floor, and it shook, and he grabbed it, and God killed him right on the spot. But it was a kind deed that he did. But the kind deed that he did was unrighteous because God told everybody, nobody is to touch the ark unless certain people of the Levites were the only ones that could carry that ark. He was not one of them. Even in his kindness, he violated. And I think that we should have a whole message concerning this truth. Sometimes you see people that are maybe going through discouraging times when God Leave them alone. Let them get discouraged. It's a plan. They need to get to the bottom of who they are. And somebody with kindness, that is an unrighteous kindness, comes and brings all kinds of stuff into their life by saying that, and it's not God behind it. And this is what Uzziah did, or Uzzah. He mended so well. He wanted to protect God and, and all the things that were in that ark. He wanted to protect the power of God, and he overstepped. And so in his kindness, he did an unrighteous deed, and God struck him dead. And that ark continued on and went to Obadam. Obadam is the name of a man that welcomed the ark. See, David, right after this, said, God, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure about this. If you're going to be this strict with us, we're not fit to have an ark around us. If you're going to be this strict with us, I'm, I'm disappointed at you, God. David expressed that. I'm disappointed at you, God, because... If we cannot even make a little mistake and touch that ark trying to help you out or trying to help it from ruining or, or hurting, etc., then we have a, I have a problem. I cannot welcome this thing in our house or in Jerusalem. And so Obadam said, bring it here. And when he brought it there, it says that life started. Even the plants grew better. Everything started sprouting, and it, it was noticed in the area of the children of Israel and the surrounding that the blessing of God fell upon Obadim because the ark of God was welcomed there because of his kindness. There's two people that were kind, and they both did a kind deed, but one was acceptable and the other one was solidly rejected. You might say like this, my friend, and I, I know that some of you think that it's not that technical. Look at your life. You say it's not that technical what you say. Look at your life. I could venture to say that every one of you that say it is not that technical have issues in your life. I'm here to tell you it is very technical. Because what a man soweth, that shall he also reap. In my lawnmower, as I'm mowing, there's several fields that I mow. One field is, um, it is off to the side, is not considered part of the yard. But I like to keep it mowed because it looks kind of nice. One of these days when I'll probably take it and sow other grass in because there's weeds and everything. But what happens here is over the years now, this little seed that came up on the deck as I mowed that, and then I went into the other yard, and I mowed that. Next thing I noticed, some of the weeds, and I questioned, will, it's, will, will this hurt it? If I go from there to here without washing it off, some of the, or blowing it off, some of the seeds, they fall in. As long as we have full lush grass, I don't think anything will come in. Well, little by little, it started. And I could take you to the place where it's done. And now you see a whole bunch of that other weeds started mingling in with that grass, the nice grass. And the next thing you have is it's taken over. See, the Bible says that God is not mocked. What a man soweth, that shall he also reap. So God is not mocked. These little seeds have all kinds of life in it. Those little words that you speak have all kinds of power. And they will not just die. They're words of power and words of effect. 
One of the things that stirred this message, I'm getting a little bit in front of my story, and I think I need to say it at this point, was something that sparked that there was a man, there was a boy. Some, perhaps most of you, all of you know, fell in fornication and he had a little child. And uh, in one of my places of business, it was heard and observed that people, even from this church, I guess, congratulated him of being a new father. And I heard about this. And I thought, I don't know who it was. I didn't ask you names. I don't want to know names. I thought immediately, sowing and reaping. The way I understand sowing and reaping, when you go, and I'll just say it, if you go and congratulate a, a young fornicator that has fallen into fornication, produced a young child, and you congratulate him for his deed, that's what you just did. Those are seeds thrown in your pathway. Later on, when your children grow up, you don't understand why one of them fell into fornication. It was a seed you sowed. Many years later, it came up. That's how I understand sowing and reaping. I've observed things. One of the things that is so grand and so wonderful to be 55 years of age is I remember things that people said, spoke 30 years ago, and I see the result today of what's coming out of them. Some of you are going like this. You're knowing what I'm saying. I remember what was said at that one time. I wonder if that person ever thought that would come back and grow back right in his garden. And see, you might say like this, well, Yes, but the problem is most of those things are not repented of. This is why we have to be careful. I was sitting in the midst one day of somebody that was divorced, left his wife, actually left his wife and married somebody else. I'll, just, I'll be very specific here. I'm going to change my story to another incident here not long ago. Well, I, well this was stirring in my heart concerning the sower. I went to a viewing of my cousin that died. And I never met her so-called husband. And found out as we were standing in line, a little bit the story and the background of this whole thing was, oh, he was married. She was married to a, someone that was married before, a divorced person. And immediately I thought, I need to be careful with my words because what I sow, I reap. And when I came up to the line of receiving or line of, uh, he was standing there and I couldn't express sympathy with him. I could not express that I, I'm sorry to hear, you know, that your wife died. It wasn't his wife as I understand the Bible. To me, to go up to a man like that and say, my sympathy is with you because you've lost your partner, et cetera, et cetera. To me, is sowing. That's how I understand sowing. You might say it's not that technical. 20 years. This is how I understand how technical it really is. I see that people financially go wrong because of what they say or things they've done or financially go right because of things of what they said or things of what they did. I will go down through the message and you'll see more of these things and examples. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 6 verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So there is a reaping of corruption. I did not clean these this morning. I only use these when I preach. And I used them last in Honduras. And I see a little spot on there that bothers me. And the Kleenex I have have lotion on them. So you have to just put up with them if you see that spot. Okay? Because <laughs> I have to too as well. Okay. He that soweth to the flesh shall reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life, ever, life everlasting. Almost all sowing is done by the tongue. I want you to hear that. Show me any other form of sowing that is done. 
What other form of sewing is it? What do your hands do that your tongue hasn't before, before prepared for it? Almost all sewing is done by this little thing right here, 2% of our body. Our body is 100%. 2% of it is right here. And God, in all his commands that he has commanded us and things that he asks us to do, etc., etc., most of this comes from this little thing right here. And as I understand the Bible, and as I understand the word of God concerning this, that this little thing is known as a helm, and it will direct and guide you all through life. I was moved to hear a testimony by Derek Prince after he died, where he said that most of his decisions that he made in life that has taken him to ministry around the whole globe into many, 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 many different countries has come by the word, the prophetic word from his own tongue. It has guided him. Now, <clears throat> somehow, I, when I have these certain feelings, because you stand here and you preach, and Dale and this is good, and Steve, good to, to remember this, something I've learned that sometimes when you're speaking, you hear an argument going on here. That there is somebody like say, uh-uh, I don't, uh-uh, I don't, I'm not. That's literally people that are talking. That's literally people that are talking. That's why sometimes interrupt and say, yeah, this is the way it is. Because one or somebody is arguing this point. Sometimes I even see it on your face. But I believe the Spirit of God searches the heart. He knows what you're thinking as I'm speaking. And he will show that to me, that someone is resisting this message. You're thinking it's not that technical. And I say, I want to look at your life. I want to look at your life. I want to bring it out on an inspection table and see that you didn't go just the way you've planned it with your mouth. Some of you might say no. I will say yes, because the word of God says yes. I, I could give you so many examples, and I don't think there would be near enough time to even start saying things that I've observed in life of people that have cert cer certain things. And now, 20 years later, all at once, they're going that exact route that they never thought they ever would, but because of what they said in their mouth. And I, I cannot hang on that because I have other things that I want to talk about. <clears throat> First of all, the tongue is an activator. That's how I understand the tongue. It activates that which comes across it. If it's faith, you believe in your heart, but you speak it. It's the word of faith that we speak. The Bible says, the word of faith which we preach. It activates. It makes something move. If I come to you and I tell you some negative statement, it makes you negative. It activates that in you. If I come to you and I give you an encouraging statement, I say, brother, keep on going. God bless you. Uh, some words that were spoken this morning as you exchanged while you were giving each other um, in that one song where we all got together and, and so forth. Those were things when others spoke that I really appreciate. That activated something in you and made you appreciate that person back even more. It made you say thank you. It made you feel good. It activated something in you. And this is what the tongue does. And you can take this down in business. You can take it down in your home. When you tell your child, no, don't do it, it activates it. Now, now they can't do it. Or if they do, they violate it. And now they feel guilty. The tongue is a powerful instrument. And I do not understand. I do not. I cannot comprehend. No, I'm saying the wrong word. I do not perceive anything in our whole entire body to be more powerful than our tongue. And I believe the Bible says it the same way. We want to look at this. It says, for he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the spirit shall reap life, life everlasting. There's two kinds of sowing. There's sowing of the flesh and sowing to the spirit. So every word that you speak, may I say, I don't know that there's a neutrality here. I understand everyday terms. I understand, hi, how are you doing? Is that spiritual? Isn't it spiritual? Some of those things I don't believe we need to define. Most of it comes from the intention of your own heart when you say it. Why do you say it? God is even more technical than that. He doesn't even just listen to what you say. He goes in and even tests that which makes you say things. That's what the Bible says. 
And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. So <clears throat> let's take a look at this tongue. Let's take a look at the sower. Here we're talking about re reaping corruption. I'll read it again. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. I think sometimes we have a wrong understanding of corruption. What is corruption? And I define it with Greek and Hebrew to find out what the original meaning was concerning corruption. If I can sow to the flesh and if I reap corruption, I'd like to know what that is. Now, if I will just tell you this, this is more of a teaching today. If I would tell you that most of you have reaped corruption already in life, could you tell me what that would be? Most of you would have to look around a little bit and say, well, what was that? But if I will explain what corruption is, I think you'll understand it, that we have all reaped corruption already. And it comes by sowing to the flesh. And I believe most of us have sowed to the flesh already. Because you have to be spiritual to sow to the spirit. And I'll say this, that there's consequences to both, or blessings, I should say, but the consequences, even though not framed right with my own tongue, consequences of sowing to the spirit is life everlasting eternal life that never stops that's what you get for sowing to the spirit when you sow to the flesh you will reap corruption so let's look at corruption in that i had to look into and see what job had to say job said i have said to corruption thou art my father to the worm thou art my mother and my sister Job looked at corruption where he was in what all went wrong in his life. It seemed that everything he had ever done and all the good things that he had going for him all at once just went upside down. And it all started going away from him. In fact, turning inside out and becoming very corrupt and corrupt. And he said to corruption, you're my father. And then he said to the worm. And here I look at two words, corruption and a worm. And I see there's something to it. How many of you have had an apple already. You bought it um, at a grocery store. You went and you bought an apple and you see a hole of a worm and you throw the whole apple away. Is that typical of you? It is of me because I don't know where all that worm went. Yeah. And they say worth than eating a worm is or seeing a worm in an apple is a half of one. <laughs> That's even worse. You've heard that before. So I pitched the apple because it's got a worm in it and I'm not interested in it. You know why? The apple has become corrupt. There was a worm in it. Job describes this corruption as a worm. And I want to look at the different worms that we find in the Bible. And I find one of them is a caterpillar. And the other one is a palmer worm. And the other one is a caterpillar palmer worm and a canker worm. And I'd like to just take a look at what those are. Those are found in Malachi, or in Job, sorry. A canker worm is a fruit eater. A canker worm is a fruit eater. A caterpillar eats at night, and a palmer worm moves in droves. These tent worms that we see around right now, there's a whole bunch of them, thousands inside them. That's a typical type of a palmer worm. They come in armies to attack. Now it says, this is what you reap when you sow to the flesh. You, you reap unnecessary things that will come into your life to devastate it, to eat the good out of it. That's a palmer worm. And a caterpillar will feast at night. During the dark times of your life, during the night of your life, is when they come to destroy. They also eat some of the daytime, but most of it is done at nighttime. And then the palmer worm is the one that goes after your fruit. And that is what corruption means. Now I'd like to, if we could bring up our lives and set them in front of this truth. What has transpired in my life? Has there been corruption in my life? Has there been something in my life that has been eaten away? Has it, did it come in droves? Did it eat in the night? The night when I'm asleep. At night when I don't see. At night 
when I'm resting. In a time of rest, this thing starts eating. And the fruits that come off of this tree, it attacks it right away. Love is one of those fruits. One of these worms, they come after love and they make it so difficult to love. They'll eat love. So love is a hard thing for you to do. It's a hard thing for you to give. It's a hard thing for you to express because you've been attacked by it. It's a thing that attacks your love. The fruits, patience. It makes you impatient. You want things now. The fruits of the Spirit. These are worms sent because of things that you've said. I can speak with this. And I know if I would have been younger at perhaps your ages as you're listening to me, I would have thought and probably would have gone over my head thinking, this is not that important. I cannot tell you with enough volume in my heart to tell you how true what I'm preaching is. is. What a man soweth, that shall he also reap. There was somebody in my family that some time ago had some property to sell. And the statement was made, we're not going to get like everybody else. We're not going to get much. I said, that's exactly what's going to happen. And that is exactly what happened. And that's the same person that says everything will always go wrong with me. And it continues to do so. They're planting seeds. That's what that is. You reap what you sow. And I, I, just, I just think it's so necessary to get to the bottom of this truth. There's many negative things in life we could give expression. of. I've even become so cautious that I know that when I'm in Honduras, I'm under a different type of attack than when I'm here because of all the witches that are down there. To the point... I've become very careful in what I say about Honduras. Follow me and think of some statements that I've made concerning going to Honduras. Because I do understand that when I do not speak it, the enemy doesn't know. But when I speak it, the enemy knows. And I don't want the enemy to know everything. Or all the intentions and everything that I'm doing. Before I get... I've learned... At one time in life, I was under severe attack with fear. And I've learned to deal with it, much of it, with my mouth. You know, the Bible says that you cannot get to heaven without your mouth. Every tongue shall confess. Do you know that the Bible says that with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation? If the tongue is not that important and the things that you say are not that important, why then does God ask your tongue to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord? Only then can you be saved. The tongue is a very important thing and is a continual sower. In the past week, whatever you've done, wherever you've been, whatever you said has sown something. It was either to the flesh or to the spirit. To the spirit, it will bring eternal life. To the flesh, corruption. I want you to give us some thought. How many times in your life have you had dreams of doing something and dreams of, of, of being something or dreams of going somewhere, dreams of building something, and all at once it was just deteriorated from the inside as a corrupt thing? And it affected everything around it. Have you ever had a corrupt computer? If you have a corrupt computer, all at once, nothing works right. When you sow to the flesh, nothing works right. It seems every intention and every dream that you start out, it falls flat. Because it's become corrupt. Because of corruption comes by something you speak. Do you get the grip of this? Some of you could be blessed in areas you're not walking in today, but you've sown things to corrupt yourself. Even though you might have had a good intention, even a kind heart, to speak some of these things, you might have said, and I speak to you business people, 
There might have been some things and some intentions that you have spoken. Some words that you have said that you will do so and so. But it was in the flesh and it will corrupt that which you're trying to do. In your home, same way. You have had inventions and you have had intentions of great things you want to do. But it was your flesh. Therefore it becomes corrupt. What I'm telling you today is one of the secrets, one of the great secrets in the true Christian life. How can one experience so much blessing and another one so much corruption is based on what you speak. That's as I understand it. Not only as I understand it, that's how I experience it. I was humbled the other night. I, some of you have heard, well, I'm not going to go into those details. I saw somebody that obviously looked like they did a facelift and a bit of a botched facelift. It looked, it looked pretty bad. And I just kind of made a remark and I made it too. And it bothered me. I tried to stammer my way out of it. And all at once I th heard that maybe it was cancer. And then I, now I really had my hands full. Why do I always have to say something? It's something that I've tried for 50 some years. Why do I always have to say something? Why does my word need to be declared? Why do I have to say it? Others can sit there and not feel obligated to say it. Sometimes they feel like something's, I heard Arlene once say this, that when she's sitting quietly in a room and nobody else talks, she just almost falls or flies apart. I get that same feeling. Somebody has to say something because the pressure is on me to say it. No. And I've asked the Lord to take that away from me. But then again, I also find that when you sit in a room full of people, nobody talks. That's not interesting either. <laughs> so, Lord, direct my heart, direct my tongue. So that wholesome healing would come out of my lips. That when I speak, people would be encouraged. That people around me could hear my voice and hear the words that I speak. And they would receive strength to go another week. This has been my prayer for many years. Found out later it was a botched face lift, but I would not have needed to say anything. Because I'm sure that person feels terrible about it. But why do they need my word in there? Why? What did I sow when I said that? Those are the things that I had to come before God and say, I'm sorry, Lord. I apologize. And I'm sorry. I don't want to sow things that will later on bring something back in my life or in my generation to my children's children. That they have to suffer unrighteously because of something that I have said. You say that doesn't work that way. Oh, yes, it does work that way. I can give you examples in the Bible in the book that I'm writing. You will see examples like that. Where something went into generations up to 500 years later, all at once there it comes. But the seed was sown way back here. I can give you some examples. Let's just look at one other one here. In James 3, it says the tongue, it sets on fire the course of nature, human nature, divine nature. The tongue helps decide destiny, whether life or death, hell or heaven. I have this little saying that I picked up some years ago and I lost and I found it again. One ship drives east and another west with the selfsame winds that blow. It is the set of the sail and not the gale that tells the ship where to go. That's what a tongue is. You can have winds that come right into your face. In fact, over in Hawaii, my wife and I were standing there on the edge, out on an edge, and we're watching a sailboat race. And they were going right into the wind. Some of them failed, but the best won. Right into the wind. You thought, how will they do this? They're coming right into the wind. They did. Because there was a little thing in the back that steered the ship. That is known as the tongue. The tongue is a helm. The Bible says it's a, like a bridle that steers the horse that will cause him to go to the woods or out on the road. That's what a tongue is. Some of you... <clears throat> Some of you have said words of unbelief that are still holding on to you today. Things that you don't believe God could do to you. Things that you don't believe God 
um, could ever change in your life. And you continue to say that because that's exactly what you said. And it's a seed that has grown and it has corrupted you. Let's remember how corruption works. Corruption, again, is that worm. Remember that. It eats the fruits. It comes in gangs and it eats at night. That's what corruption does. At a time when you're looking the other way, it got you. When you sow to the flesh, you will certainly reap corruption. And when you sow to the spirit, you will have life everlasting. Always full of life. This is what the Bible says. I would like to just cut some things short because of time. Um, there is a man in our community here. I'm not mentioning his name. But I used to be in a church many years ago where this man was present. And I remember they had so many problems with this man because he was a crafty man. And you could never, you knew he was full of violations and things that he did. He was known as turning some, doing some shady business deals. And he was just crafty. He just outsmarted about everybody. He was tricked. And you know, this, somehow it came to the place where they always tried to deal with him and he always slipped out here and nobody could prove and not, it was just, that's the way he lived. Do you know that he was, he was sowing a seed through that time? And here in the latter years, he got tricked into some business deal that took him all he had. And he ended up a pauper. His family had to take care of him. You sow? You sow trickery? You're going to get tricked. You sow dishonesty? You'll be in the short end of the deal someday. You lie? You'll be lied to. This is how it works. I've seen stories today that I've, I've seen what I'm talking about today as something so real. You think God is not seeing you. And even if God wouldn't, you're still sowing. If I take this little seed and I throw it out, even though it's a small little thing, and I throw it out into the yard and I think nobody will ever see it, God doesn't see it, doesn't even care, of it, care about it. Next thing I know, and we find that in our garden or in our uh, flower beds, all at once there's a tree starting to grow because there was a seed in there somewhere. And if you don't pull it out right away, it'll become bigger and bigger. And all at once you can't pull it out anymore. You got to cut it off and then wrestle with it. We have one out there I didn't pull out in time and it keeps growing. Then I cut it off and there it comes again and keeps growing. And that's how some of the words that you have spoken in your lives have affected you if you've not repented of them. Sometimes, well, I want to move on. Psalms. In fact, here's one thing I want to say about Hosea. You sow the wind, you will reap the whirlwind. This is what Hosea says in chapter 8. It says, you have plowed wickedness, you will reap iniquity, and eaten the fruit of lies. No discernment. How do you plow iniquity? If I plow in iniquity, that means... How do you plow? You open something up. If I go to somebody and open them up in my carnal nature and I hurt them and I wound them with my words, what will I reap out of it? This is what Hosea says. He says, you will reap, you will reap, I just read it. You will reap iniquity and you will eat of the fruit of lies. You'll believe some things, that means you will lose your discernment. If you go to a man and just plow him from one from his back, you just open him up so you can give your point across, so you can say something, some of the venom that is in you, and you just hurt him and wound him, you will lose your discernment, is what Hosea says. And I believe that's the Bible. And what will happen later on, you will run into these situations where the same thing happens to you. Because you have sown that. 
I'm not giving reverence, ref, reference to things that you have done when you were a child or when you were with the young people or when you were messed up years ago. If you've repented of it, I don't believe that will come back. That's one way to kill those seeds. But the things that you are doing now, the, yesterday and last week and last month and last year, those are things that are coming back to get you because you've sown them and you've not repented of it. Therefore, it's still there and it grows. It'll come right back. Some of you will grow it to your children's reaping. Later on, your children, you wonder why in the world do my children all go this route? You've sown it. Why in the world are, are all at once, it just seems everything, ah, I have said some words that have turned their course, not even to them. But if you repent of it, God will not hold it against you and those plants will not continue. The ax is laid to the root of the tree, but you have to recognize the tree. This is how it works. I have sat in front of people that were crying and weeping. Why all at once is the whole world turning upside down on me? And then I ask them these questions like, look back into your life. What were some of the things and the attitudes that you carried out of your tongue or words that you spoke down through those times in all your past and all at once their light bulbs go on and say, ah, oh, I remember, look at this. You mean this is what that is? Yeah, that's what that is. You express things against somebody. Later on it'll come back because you're sowing. Dalon's message on the fear of God, I was not here that time. This has to do with the fear of God. There's things you cannot say. You might think it, but you cannot say it because of the fear of God. There's things you cannot brag about. You have all the bragging rights in the world, but it's out of the flesh. It goes unnoticed. It has to stay unnoticed. You open some of these things up, you're doing things that will affect you and your next generation unless you repent of it. It's the tongue. It's my sower. How many times have I heard people say some, make some statement? In fact, even here at times when I'm up here, I hear some people make statements. They say, oh, oh, you don't know what you're saying. That's going to come back and bite you. We need to be careful. And I, if I could just tell you, remember, as you go down through life in the daytime, you're going like this, and everybody you pass by, you're sowing seeds. You're sowing seeds. Now I'm going to walk all the way to the back. You're sowing seeds. Words that you speak to people both sides of you. You're sowing seeds, and you're sowing seeds, and you're sowing seeds. You just keep sowing, you keep talking. People ask you for your opinion. You keep talking, you say what you think. You know what? The day will come when I have to get back up there and I come right back past those seats that I have sown. That's exactly how I see the life of us. Now I see what I have sown. Why is this? Why is that? Why is this? I've spoken things against healing. Now I don't know why I don't get healed. I've spoken things concerning the Holy Ghost. Now I don't know why the Holy Spirit isn't with me. When you sow reap of the flesh, corruption. When you sow to the Spirit, that's what you receive. Eternal life, life everlasting. So... When I look at my life, and one of the cries on my heart is, God, help me to be overly careful what I say. Because I have a, the tendencies of a quick tongue. I have tendencies of saying something quick. But when I am aware that I'm sowing something every time I walk, everything that comes out of here is sowing something. It puts a carefulness in me, a new carefulness. And it continues like that every day, more careful, more careful. Lord, today, let my tongue glorify only you. Let me say nothing 
that will bring corruption in my life. You say big deal. And this is what I see some of you. You sit here with your little children. And I, I'm, I'm one of them that used to be this way. You see the little baby. Oh, wow. Oh, so nice to have a little baby. Turn that little baby into 17, 18 years old. That's reality. And you've got 16, 15, 16 years of seeding into that little life. Not only into that little life. Broadcasting wherever you go. Later on, you're going to come walking back through there. And you. And when I, I had, I, it, this broke me up quite a bit in what I was writing on this. That the things that I had spread and the things that I had, you know, and I'm doing this and I'm talking and doing these things. That I go and we come and they follow me. It's just the way it works in life. Now, will they have blessing? Will I have a garden for them? Or will I have the curses of man? What have I prepared for them? A place of beauty, a place of rest, a place of godliness, a place of where it's God's garden. Or do I have a place of evil and guilt and, and, and corruption and corruption and corruption that will follow that generation? To know that I'm the one that is ahead of that. And I speak to you, you're the head of your generations to come. What are you saying? What are you speaking? What, what forms of word come out of your lips? Are you saying that's not for me? Then it will not be for you. Are you saying I don't want the Holy Spirit because I'm afraid it would make me? Then you will not have the Holy Spirit. It's just like that. What you sow, you will reap. I'm discouraged, really. Yeah, I'm always discouraged. You'll always be discouraged. I'm always discouraged. You're laying it. You're spreading it. You're saying it. Now, one thing that I don't believe in is this thing of, well, I'm discouraged. I'm going through a discouraging time. You recognize that and you stay with the truth. Speak the truth. Don't say, you were saying that he's healed. Mervyn is not healed. He's sneezing. Jesus healed us. If I can bring that from there to here by believing in him, then I'm healed. By his stripes, I've been healed. But when, as long as my head continues to hurt, I'm not healed. If I have a headache, I have a headache. And we have to not lie against the truth. That's that modern believism that we have. Where it's, I do not accept that. No, I don't accept. Well, the, the truth is, yeah, I have a headache and I have a bad headache. No, I don't have a, yes, you have a headache. God only heals those that are sick. When you're sick, you're sick. Then you ask for healing. That's how that works. And we live in this easy believism where you just believe everything. No, no, I'm not sick. I'm not sick. You just threw up. I'm not sick. I'm not sick. Oh, no. You're sick and God will not heal you. That's, that's called bullheadedness. It's not called faith. Some people think that's faith. That's not faith. That's bullheadedness. You're afraid you'll bring something on you by not saying the truth. That's not the way God says it. God only heals the sick. He did it in the Old Testament. They brought the what? The who? In today's age, they would have brought them all that were well. Still were really in bad shape, but they were all well. They would not have even looked at them because they were lying against the truth. Amen? We need to always be honest. Here's a little excerpt that I brought out of the book. The source of where it originates is the fate of its future. The seed. The source of it where it originates is the fate of its future. If it originates from the flesh, the future will be the flesh. If it originates from the spirit, the future is life. I've been made keenly aware that I'm the voice not of my own but of the one I represent. In fact, I came to the grips of this truth, and some of you might find a criticism about it, but I came to the grips of this truth that I found all at once, that if not all, but most of the things that I say happen. Because not that I am somebody, but because I believe what I say. 
I have faith in what I say. You need to do as well. 1 Peter 3.10 For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking no guile. That they speak no guile. You know, we think re refrain your tongue from evil. Simple thinking, okay? I want you to hear this. That is telling a little off-colored story. That is from evil. Oh, it includes that, most definitely. But that's not what this is talking about. If I could even say this, and some of you might have a problem with it, but there are things even much more evil than that in expressing unbelief, in not believing God's word, in disagreeing with God's word. That to me is extremely evil. These other things are evil as well. But this is what he's referring to. And then it says his lips from speaking guile. Now I want to get to this thing that I've observed. I'm a person that is a bit shy. I, told, I asked my wife this morning, I said, who do you think, what do you think I would be if I would have never been ordained? Because of all the criticisms that I've gotten in this community down through the years have put in me, they've, they've had a, an effect on me. It's no question about that. But then my question went back further, and I asked myself, what would I have been if I would have never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because that's what happens, that I had to speak. I had to speak. I had to open my mouth concerning repentance, concerning sin. I had to speak, and as a result, lost many friends. My question is this. I've observed people that make friends. I've observed them. And I'm not going to say that anybody is perceived in this church. But... <clears throat> This morning, let me say this, that I, I have observed, and I have observed quite with a lot of consideration. And I've drawn one conclusion of the ones that I've observed, that the ones that I have observed that are wanting all these friends, it is all for a selfish reason. That's what I've observed. Because I have found, listen to me carefully, I have found in most cases for these people that are just wanting to be friends, 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 they'll do anything for everyone as long as they can get them on their side. They're the ones that as soon as that person gets away from their presence, they have something bad to say about them. My wife and I were actually with someone that we felt that certainly there's bad things they're going to talk about us because they talk bad about everybody else. Those are friend seekers. I will tell you, I'm not one of those. I'm one of those people that if I'm your friend, I'm your friend. I will not speak bad about you. But I do have a problem that when I see somebody coming to me and wanting to be a friend, not, not specifically from this church, I'm not saying church, I'm excluding that. In the common world we live in, I want to be a friend or I... Uh, I just, I have a hard time trusting them because so many times in my observations, those are people, as soon as you turn their back, it's <laughs> so who are friends? Some of you would long to have more friends. And the older you get, the more you long for it. I don't know if there's enough older people to say amen to that. <laughs> you long, I long for friends. I do. I long for friendship. Not tag-alongs, but I, I long for friendship because I've, I noticed that I've kind of excluded myself in a lot of ways. But then I found that there are some real friends that will be friends. This is why um, I came to my wife here a while back. No, I, in her birthday. That even though I have been with a lot of friends that day, so-called friends, but I still consider her to be my best friend. Just my absolute best friend because she knows everything about me. I can tell her everything I want to. I can tell her everything about me and she will not think bad of me. That's my friend. If you have somebody like this in the church that you can tell them everything. And I would like to say this, that in the pastoral ministry here, that's the way it is. I can tell them everything about me and I know they would not think bad of me. That's friendship. By doing little kind deeds to each other is not necessarily friendship. Sometimes it's called manipulation to try to make you think good of me because I don't think good of you. That's what I've been finding. Why do you want friends? And it comes by what you say. 
It has to do with seeds that we sow. If I sow seeds that will bring life to you, you will... Any other way of bringing friends into your life, you, have, you must consider it a defeat because they're not true friends. And I, I just, I would just like to, if I could just encourage some of you. Some of you are very shy. And I under, have an understanding of that, to be very shy. And you don't want to be shy. And I've looked at that as my children. I wish, oh my anything that I could do over that my children wouldn't be shy. And I don't believe they are. My children are not known to be shy. And a lot of this I contribute to my wife, which is such a good-natured woman. And she just has so many friends. And very few people in my lifetime experience that I know of have spoken evil of her. In fact, I define it down to about two people. And then I also hear that the Word of God says something about that. Whoa, when all men speak well of you. <laughs> yeah, but it says men, doesn't say women. <laughs> yeah. But my wife is one of those people. She, she is just one of those people that she gives and gives. She loves to give. And she doesn't look for anything to receive. Many times where I thought my wife should be on the receiving end here because of all that she's given. And it, it, it's just her heart. She just loves to give. I, I can be in the room. I can be in there. This is the first step in the door. Can I get you something to eat? It's the last thing I need. But she's always, always, it's, can I get something to eat? Can I get you something? Can I get, always concerned, can I get you something? It's because it's the nature of my wife. And not all of us have that nature. And I think there's some things that some of you people that have a problem with shyness, I will, I will just tell you, later on in life, you'll get into a condition where you wish like everything, you would have changed that. Some of you are here that you almost have no friends, even inside the church, because you're so reserved and so quiet. I would ask you in Jesus' name to break through that. You need to break through that. There's other people just like you that are yearning to be friends. They're yearning to have somebody that is a friend to you, but they're also shy. But somehow, and it comes by opening your mouth. That's how it starts. Even though it's difficult, my thing is, well, what do I have to say? I can't say anything. You know, there's another viewing coming up. Do I? Oh, I just can't go to viewing. I don't know what to talk to people. I've got nothing in common with the world. I don't. I go to some event, and they just want to talk about sports. I know nothing about sports. They want to talk about business. I know nothing about business. You talk about deeper things of God, they know nothing about that. And so I'm just always kind of the one that is out there. And then I look at some of my children, are, and I'm just use, going to use this because I want to talk a little bit of end this with a, about friendship. Then I noticed my son, uh, Mike, he's, just, he's found favor with so many people and with high people. Some of the bigger companies in the U.S. in a certain supply group, his CEO always wants him to play golf with him. Invited to some of the biggest, um, the biggest golf courses in Ohio, private, to be with them. I don't even know those people. How can you find favor with those? And Michael is not one of those people. He's just, you know, he's one of those people you don't hear and talk about people around people's back. He's a friend. A friend will not do that. A friend will not say hi to you, and as soon as you go, they'll go, poof. That's not a friend. And you can smell it. I told it to our employees, getting off to the side a little bit. Told it to our employees. In, in, I've instructed them. Never look at your customer as being, you know, oh, hi, as soon as they go. Because <laughs> it leaves an attitude, and they smell it. They sense that. And that's what I sense amongst those people that are always so friendly. Oh, so good to see you all at once. Uh-huh. I've smelled that before. As soon as I turn, it's like, Poof. did you see your shoes? <laughs> we sow. And what we sow is what we have surrounded ourselves with. You have an unkind demeanor. It comes by way of sowing. Some of you have sown very little in life, but you have reaped everything you've sown. Big things. 
How can we undo these things? How can I undo my daily path that I walk on, that I do sowing and I reaping, I reap, I sow and I reap? How can I undo the things that are not right? Number one, you have to recognize the words that you spoke and you need to repent of it. You need to ask God to, somebody told me lately, stop by when I was mowing on the outside, stop by and he just came in and wanted to chat a little bit. Somebody from out of the state, hey, how are you doing? He said, I was at a certain church over the weekend. And he said that the preacher said he just, just kind of a simple way of saying it. he said repentance is simply quitting. That's what it is. No, it's not. Many people have quit without repenting. Repenting is not quitting. Repenting to me is a divine work of God. That you will make a commitment of confession and telling and uh, and, and and acknowledging your iniquity before God. And then God will supernaturally work in your life and remove it from you. It's not just quitting. Many, in that case, many people have gone this world, have quit this and quit that, but they never found repentance. To me, repentance is a spiritual thing. And when you see that you're in violation of your tongue, the things that you speak, the things, and I want you to take a look at little details of your life. That when maybe you've said something that healing is for others, but not for me. And you'd wonder why you can't get healed. You've never seen the fallacy and the untruth that you spoke about that. And it's growing. Remember, I, I just see this picture so clear. I go through life. I walk down here. This is how I go. I spread, I spread, I spread, I spread, I spread. I spread, here it is, words I speak, there it goes, and there it goes. Now I have to come back, and now I see what I've done. There's, why is that there? And all at once, there's that serpent that wants to bite me right there. Why? I'm so innocent with this, and all, no, no, no. ah, I have sown some seeds, and now I'm reaping it. I'm always negative. See, people say, ah, that's not me. But people say that I always see the negative part of life. The cup is always half empty. Or half full. Those are things you need to change. Those are solid decisions you need to make in your life. Concerning your future and for your children's future. Because what you will sow, you will reap. Because you can't mock God. You can say, oh, big deal. You can say big deal to God, but God will come right behind you and say, it's not a big deal. You've sown it and it will grow. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. What a man soweth, that shall he surely reap. It's the truth. And even by saying that, I believe God is putting a stamp on it. And I am sure to make it be that way. Because the good seeds you sow, I want them to bring goodness to your life. And if I have a law against reaping, you can sow all the good you want. You'll never get good. And I want that to be with you. But the other will also have to work. So if you speak uh, out of your flesh, you will reap corruption. If you will speak out of your spirit, the spiritual things, you will reap life everlasting. Have you noticed, have you had your eyes open that you've been around people that seemingly were full of life? Have you ever seen that? Have you ever noticed what they talk about? Those people that are so full of life, have they been very negative? They're not. Is it because what they sow, they're reaping? We think eternal life is in heaven. It starts here. You want to know who you are? Listen to who you, what you say. That's who you are. One of the things that I've... And I'm going to be very honest with you. That's one thing that I try to be as a very honest man. If I have a problem, I will not hide it. I will not pretend as though I'm something when I'm not. And one of those things is that I've been asking the Lord specifically. Inside the church, I trust you people. And I love you people. I have... I just, I love you and I trust you and I would defend you to my grave. That's who I am. If somebody says something bad about you from the public or so, I'll defend you and I'll stand with you and I, I always have and I always will. 
lately my wife met somebody that they were talking a little bit and they were talking about somebody in church. And my wife didn't know what to say. What, what should I, I, I don't know, how, I don't know. Because I don't know how this person is in, in public. I don't want to say that man's a really, a, or a woman is a real good Christian, a real asset in the church. I don't know how they are on the jobs. That's awkward. How are you on your jobs? How are you out there? Somebody comes to us and says, oh, yeah, yeah, you work with so-and-so and so. Oh, you do? So I say, oh, wow, he's a great Christian, isn't he? Or is it, oh, boy, I hope. <sighs> sowing and reaping. What you're sowing is what you're reaping. My thing is, people outside the church that want to start a spiritual conversation off, and, and it, you can often, it's not very deep, and you know, and you start talking with them, and the next thing you know is, oh, well, yeah, well, this is my third wife, and it's my third husband, and all this and that. It's just, I don't even want to start talking about scripture to people out there because you never know what all you'll get into. All at once, you know, and, and here, this happened to me not so long ago. I was talking to somebody about the Bible and so on. I was, oh, you know, there's some fellowship here. Oh, that's interesting. Next thing, it was uh, Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone. Absolute Twilight. Movie Twilight Zone is demonic. Absolute demonic. It's devilish. And how can Pete? I just, and so it causes me just to lose confidence in the world out there. I really don't, I find myself, I don't have a place. This is where we find our place with God. We walk in a different place. Our friends are not friends of the world. I don't have to feel at odds as I don't have friends in the world. I don't. I want to draw, to, draw this to a close. 1 John 3.18 says, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Maybe without telling someone you really love them. I really love you. I've just, oh, I've always thought so much of you. Start doing it in deed and in truth. That's how you really know. These little kindness things, these little things that happen that you just do, and you don't really do it because you're not trying to win them as being your friend. You're just simply doing it because you love them. Let's not do it in word, but in deed and in truth. Amen? Start, start dealing with people this way. And I would say, like to say within the church here, start doing some of that. You do it to the preachers. You give the preachers a little gift. Sometimes, maybe some of you, it's good to give it to the preacher. We really appreciate it. It makes us, it, makes us, uh, it humbles us. Maybe do it with each other. It doesn't have to be someone that's going through a hard time. Somebody that's, you know, has Jesus in their life. Just give them a little gift. Just the other night, we were invited to somebody outside the church to come for a, lot, for a supper. We went there. It was delightful. Somebody we love. And we were there. Maybe, maybe we need to do some more of that. Invite people over. It doesn't have to be a great big thing. Just, just some little things here and there. Rather than doing so much in word, let's start doing it in deed and in truth. That's really where it counts. Verse 19, and hereby we know that we are of truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Psalm 34, 12, what man is he that desires life and love many days that he may see good? Verse 13, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. You know, when a person comes up to me and he wants to be my friend and he's all woozy and happy about it, and then he turns away from me and he says, Pah. I think we all saw that on Fox News in the, on the Internet. They have that little YouTube thing where they had a, the camera wasn't turned off. And they were just doing this thing, you know, oh, it's a, you know, it's a privilege to see you and all that. And then the camera was not turned off. And they left, and they thought it was turned off, and he was going, yeah, yeah, I just did. Yeah, yeah. Just spotting. 
If you are like that, you're not a friend. If you're not friends. Youth, I want to speak to you. Sometimes you have this. I don't know where I shouldn't walk anymore. <laughs> you have this with each other because there's competition amongst youth. The girls all want to be the prettiest. The men all want to be the most men. Men. And in order to win that, sometimes you think you have to put that other person down. That's not being real. It's just not being real. You will have by far the most friends if you are a friend by way of truth and deed. That's how you win friends. That's who you are. That's the intrinsic value of who you really are. Goes with us out here. You need not put anybody down. And this is what I said, God, you need to deal with me concerning this. Because outside the church and in the business world and so forth, there are just things when someone says everything good about somebody, I just say, ah, oh, but he's not spiritual minded. I always want to fight rather than saying, well, yeah, there is somebody that, you know, they've, they've done a lot of good things. Rather than compliment them and thinking that it's something about me that always wanted to say, yeah, but... And I ask God, remove that out of me. I don't want that. The Bible still says, rejoice with them that rejoice. Rejoice with them that rejoice. If they're rejoicing, I rejoice with them. They say something good about them, wonderful. Something good. We always hear all this bad. What comes out of your mouth? Are you a true friend? When you can go up and shake somebody's hand and say like this, oh, so good to see you. Are you lying or are you saying the truth? Those are words that you speak and those are seeds that go out and they will start growing surely. Is this what the Bible talks about? Irvin, good to see you. Wow, good to see you. Wow, hallelujah. Boy, I don't like Irvin. He's just, huh? Is it good to see him? Do you enjoy him? Be careful what you say. Is it, let it be in deed. Let it be in truth. Some of you have these problems because I speak to humans. Because it's so easy to be smiley and say, hey, good to see you. Wow, well, yeah. And then you go to your friend over here and says, I just can't stand that person. Just... <sighs> what you sow, you will reap. God will not be mocked with this one. If you act as a friend and you're not, you will induce enemies upon you. That's what you reap. You act as a friend, but you're not. You will induce enemies. That's the reaping is enemies. There's only one other place where God changes this picture. And that's what I want to leave you hang with today. I have a big thing. That's actually called guile. The Bible says that there is no guile in heaven. When the kingdom was opened and heaven was opened, the door, he looked and saw the army of God. And he says they were roped in ropes of righteousness, white and clean. And there was no guile found in their mouth. They were real. They were just real. When they, they were friends, they were friends. They didn't say they were friends when they were not friends. When they were happy to see you, they said they were happy to see you. They didn't say they were happy to see you when they weren't happy to see you. They were real. They had no guile in their lips. And it says that about Jesus had no guile either. He had no guile in his mouth. And he was astounded to see the Jewish man that confessed to him, that spoke to him. He said, ah, a Jewish man that has no guile? Almost you don't see it. Like, oh, good to see you. Wow. Pooh. Who is that guy? Now, there's another side to some of this. And I think you church need to learn some of this. I've said this how many times. You can learn so much if you'd shut your mouth. Sometimes we meet people that we know they have been further than we are. Who are we to teach them? Sit back, listen. Learn from them. Learn. They don't have to hear everything. They're probably not learning a thing. 
that you're trying to teach them. In fact, they could probably tell you a lot more if you would just listen once. Sometimes you can be a good friend without saying a word, but you just know. I've never experienced this in a funeral. They say that in a funeral, there's people that walk by. They don't know what to say. They'll just shake your hand. I've heard more compliments about that than what people have said. Sometimes that's what we have to give. What we have or what we... That is... My, my words are wrong here. Sometimes that is what we need to give. Rather than all this. Just a... I would venture to say that the best friends can do that. When you know somebody will come up and has no words for you, but just uh, you don't question that friendship. But when it's, oh, wow, you've just, uh, you've just hit the nail on the head today. Everything was, uh, yeah. Now I have in big words, but God. But God, what about him? 1 Corinthians 15, 42, my little grandchild. 1 Corinthians 15, 42, 43, and 44 in closing. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, but raised in incorruption. Sown in dishonor, raised in glory. Sown in weakness, raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. It is sown a natural body, and there is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. When God comes on the picture, you can put some wrong seeds in the natural body, and it'll come up a spiritual body. There's a difference. All this while, I've been talking about putting wrong seats and they all grow wrong. Here God, when God comes on the scene, he takes this human vessel that is absolute kernel. And he puts them down by way of that man dying to himself. Rather than raising up an ev a seed even more evil or a, a plant more evil, he has raised a spiritual body. Because God came on the scene. God can change this over. God can take those evil seeds that you've thrown out. Make other things come up. But it's only but God that can do that. Can you hear me? What do I do with all the seeds that went out? I repent. I ask him to forgive me, Lord. I'm sorry for the words that I have wrongly spoken. I don't ever want to say these things again. Please guard my tongue. And now what looked like a corn stalk will turn into something completely different. Because God is on the scene. But God, it, is, it says a carnal man turning into a spiritual man. Because God came on the scene. It doesn't work like this. When you repent of these things, he goes out and cuts them all down. Now they're all laying. You've got nothing in your field. No, he turns them around. From mustard to corn. From... Poison ivy to a watermelon. Because God came on the scene. That's how it works. It is a supernatural work. Sown in by na na natural man going in, coming out spiritual. Sown in weakness, raised in power. But when you sow to the flesh, it's sown in weakness. And what comes up around you will even make you more weak. But when you repent of it and turn it back to God, it comes up in power and strength. This is the hope of the saints. So this is what I'm telling you today. Don't go home sorry and sorrowful and have your face on the ground. Repent. Ask the Lord to forgive you for your sin. Forgive you what you've sown. And he will take all those plans that you've sown in the past week or in the past month or in the past year or whenever they were sown. And he will change them and completely turn your field into a prosperous field because he is God. But God. Do you understand that? Friends, that's where I walk. 
If I would have everything that I have ever, every evil thing that I've ever planned that if I'd be reaping for it today, ain't no way I can, I, I just, I'd be so discouraged. But God, after I gave it to God, he turned all these things and it beautified my place. Rather than the dragon, rather than the snake in the rushes, what comes up? A highway of escape. No more snakes, no more dragons, no more, what does it say, lions? No, but you've done your sowing. I want to leave you with that. You don't go home today thinking, oh my, I'm just, oh, I'll just reap the rest of my life. Repent what you've sown. Repent what you've sown. Recognize what you've sown. Recognize the tune of your voice or the tone of your voice, what's coming out of your heart. It's connected. It's connected. What's coming out of your heart? And let God change that. Ask him to forgive what you've said. When you've complained, ask him to forgive you for complaining because it's wrong to complain. Ask him to forgive you and he will take all the things you've sown and turn them into a beautiful garden. That's my life. If I would have, if I would receive what I have sown, there'd be no hope for my generation, be no hope for me, but he's changed it around because I died. And when I died, he rose up in me as a new man. Amen. Known as born again. Born again. Not the same man. And now there's fruits and beautiful things to take hold of. No more corruption. You need to take this home and believe it. You need to take this with you and believe it. You need to walk in this. Turn those words back over to God. The things you've said in the past week, in the past month, the things that you will say tomorrow. Let God put a mark in your heart that when you violate something, I've asked him to do this. And he does it. Absolutely keep my tongue from guile. And there's times, I, I, right there by the crossroad, I, I'm ready to say something and there is, uh, 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 uh. It's the Holy Spirit telling me, no, 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 don't, don't, don't say that, don't say that. Then I have a choice. I can continue or stop. Ask the Lord to do that. And I'm going to pray for you that God would do that.